Adolf Eichmann. He was the logistical brain behind Hitler's final solution. He organized the transportation and incarceration of six million Jews to the death camps. The Holocaust made him rich. Before sending the Jews to their deaths, Eichmann stole their last possessions and sold them for profit. He was the nuts and bolts man, the SS functionary behind the scenes who made industrialized murder work. At the end of the war, when others were being arrested, Eichmann vanished. He had escaped to Argentina. He thought he was safe, but on his tail was Israel's ruthless intelligence agency, Mossad. The result would be one of the most audacious kidnappings ever. And perhaps the most famous Nazi trial of them all. April 1960, an El Al jet touched down in Argentina. On board was a group of men posing as air stewards. They were members of Mossad, Israel's fearsome secret service. Their task was to track down and kidnap one of the most notorious war criminals still on the run, Adolf Eichmann. Now the Israelis were going to make him pay. Adolf Eichmann had been on the run for 15 years. He was hiding with fellow ex-Nazis in Argentina. The plan to abduct him and put him on trial was a high-risk mission. If it went wrong, it would lead to a serious international incident. If it succeeded, one of the major players of the Holocaust would finally be brought to justice. Eichmann was totally unaware that his days as a free man were numbered. His past was about to come back and haunt him. Adolf Eichmann grew up in Austria. Before becoming a Nazi, his life was something of a failure. At school, he was a dropout, leaving without any formal qualifications. He then failed as a mechanic. Eichmann was reduced to trying a succession of minor jobs before ending up as a clerk in an oil company. His work demanded that he organize the delivery of oil and other stocks to customers across Austria. The high school dropout had started to find his calling. He worked out the company's delivery schedules to the smallest detail. And he ensured the goods were delivered with the utmost efficiency. It was the early 1930s, and a new political force would transform his life. Adolf Hitler's brand of right-wing politics appealed to Eichmann. His rhetoric of a greater Germany incorporating Austria into an Aryan empire struck a chord with the young Clark. So Eichmann joined the Nazi party in 1932. His path to evil had now begun. Eichmann's progress was rapid. A year later, he joined the SS. The SS was Hitler's personal bodyguard. 
They guarded the Nazi leader wherever he went and pledged an oath of loyalty to Hitler first and the Nazi party second. Joining the SS was no easy task. Recruits had to prove racial purity, fitness, and strength. For a man whose life had been a failure, at last, he had status. And he never looked back. Eichmann soon fell under the influence of SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was a racist and rabid anti-Semite. He waged a crusade to make Germany racially pure. When the Nazis gained more power, their anti-Semitism grew out of control. Himmler wanted an answer to the Jewish problem. His vision was of Germany, Judenrein, or Jew-free. He invited solutions from every quarter. Eichmann saw this as his chance. By becoming an expert on Judaism, he thought he could become a big figure in the SS. So he studied Jewish history, culture, and religion. He even learned Hebrew. The Nazis' first plan was to repatriate and deport all of Germany's 200,000 Jews. And in 1938, events in Austria would be the catalyst for Eichmann's personal involvement in this process. In March, Adolf Hitler annexed Austria. He was welcomed as a hero. Now, Adolf Eichmann was sent into Austria to deal with the Jews. He was asked to form the Central Office for Jewish Emigration. Its sole role was to expel all 180,000 Jews from Austria. It was a task he took to with relish. Eichmann didn't care where the Jews went or how they got there. His one goal was simply to get them out. To achieve this end, he used terror and intimidation. A hundred thousand Jews were forced out in one year. This forced exodus also made Eichmann rich. In order for Eichmann's office to issue the necessary exit visas, the Jews had to settle their taxes. These often amounted to everything they possessed. Eichmann kept the money for himself. The Jews left the country penniless, but alive. Soon, however, even that would change. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Europe. The continent was plunged into war. The German Blitzkrieg crushed everything in its path.
But all this incredible success created a massive problem. German troops captured three million Jews. Now they needed to get rid of them. At first, special squads of soldiers and police were sent in to execute them. Thousands were killed this way. But this messy work of murder was expensive, inefficient, and took its toll on the soldiers' morale. While the Nazis worked out what to do with the Jews left alive, an interim plan was needed. Eichmann was called upon again. He was instructed to establish ghettos, walled holding areas located throughout occupied Poland. The planning of these ghettos was typical of Eichmann. They were centered near train stations to ensure that the residents could be transported anywhere as quickly as possible. It was a convenient byproduct for Eichmann that countless Jews died in the ghettos from disease and starvation. But soon came the opportunity that would transform Adolf Eichmann into one of the most notorious men in the SS. In July 1941, Eichmann was summoned by Reinhard Heydrich, Himmler's deputy in the SS. Heydrich was particularly famous for his hatred of Jews. He was one of the most feared men in Europe. He and Eichmann had already created a formidable working relationship. Now Heydrich detailed the problem facing them. The ghettos were overflowing. The death rate was not high enough. Heydrich needed someone to help him in a very important role. Eichmann was put in charge of subsection 4B4 of the Reich Central Security Office. Housed in a bland building on Kurfürstenstrasse in Berlin, this innocuous sounding department hid a dark secret. From here, Eichmann would help run the policy known as the Final Solution. It had been decided the Jews would be sent to special extermination camps. There, they would be murdered in huge numbers with poison gas, a quick, industrialized method that was cheap and efficient. The bodies would then be incinerated in ovens. But there was a problem. Getting all the Jews from the occupied territories to the different camps was a logistical headache. What was needed was someone with meticulous attention to detail. Somebody good with numbers and timetables. Adolf Eichmann was made the transportation administrator of the final solution. He oversaw the rail system that deported the Jews from all over Europe to the camps and eventually to their deaths. He was so good at his job that the commandant of the Auschwitz death camp complained that Eichmann was sending him more human freight than he could possibly kill.
for three years, Eichmann ensured the flow of human cargo to the camps never stopped. But by September 1944, the course of the war had turned against Germany. On the coast of Normandy, between Cherbourg and the Seine, Allied landings secured a bridgehead wide and deep. The Allies had landed in France on D-Day in June 1944, and they had crossed the German border for the first time by September. Renewed First Army activity on the Hürtgen Forest Front through which our troops have been fighting since crossing the German frontier in September. Tanks pace the advance of an infantry division. Now on German soil, the Allies were battling their way towards the heart of the Reich. SS Chief Heinrich Himmler realized the war was lost. He sent out a decree that all deportations to death camps should cease. Himmler was hoping to hide as much evidence of the Nazi atrocities as possible from the advancing allies. But Eichmann would have none of it. He continued to view the Jews as a disease. He had been posted to Hungary in the last months of the war. Though chaos reigned all around, and the Third Reich seemed doomed, he ignored Himmler's edict to stop. Instead, he rounded up 50,000 Jews and, with no trains running, sent them on an eight-day march to their deaths. Only the defeat of the Reich ended Eichmann's slaughter. On May the 7th, 1945, Germany finally surrendered. The slaughter of the Jews was at last over. Now the true scale of the Holocaust was revealed. The German concentration camp at Buchenwald. Ten British MPs have come to see for themselves. They came to see the whipping block, to talk with the living, to look at the dead, to see the cremation ovens the world did not believe existed. When the full horror of the death camps was in the open, everyone agreed that the perpetrators must be punished. But as Allied war crimes investigators started rounding up the top Nazis, Adolf Eichmann, the nuts and bolts man behind the Holocaust, vanished without trace. Adolf Eichmann was on the run. He was holed up in the mountains of the Austrian Tyrol, along with a small band of SS officers. However, after a few days, his companions asked him to leave. They didn't want to be caught with a major war criminal. Eichmann now melted into the throngs of prisoners of war and demobilized Germans who were making their way across Germany. He ditched his distinctive SS uniform and dressed as a Luftwaffe corporal, calling himself Adolf Barth. After trudging for several days, Eichmann had got as far as the outskirts of the city of Ulm in southwest Germany. There, he was picked up by a US Army patrol and taken to a prisoner of war camp at Weiden.
As Eichmann waited to be processed, he noticed that officers were excused manual work, whereas enlisted men were worked hard every day. So he changed his identity yet again. Now he called himself Otto Ekman, a junior officer. Eichmann was held at Weiden for two months before being moved to Oberdarkstaden in northern Bavaria. It was now that Eichmann faced his first real problem. He could change his name. He could hide from witnesses. But one thing he couldn't get rid of was the distinctive SS tattoo under his left arm, which indicated his blood type. Allied soldiers were on the lookout for this telltale sign of membership of the SS. What's more, Jewish concentration camp survivors were taken to the prisoner of war camps to pick out those responsible for war crimes. Eichmann feared that his true identity would soon be uncovered, because by now the world was learning exactly what role he had played in the Holocaust. Behind the cold, gray facade of this courthouse in Nuremberg, the greatest trial drama of our times begins. Here, the governments of France, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States, representing civilization, oppose the top 20 leaders of an aggressor nation. The big Nazis are being charged with mass crimes against humanity. The world's first war crimes trial started on the 21st of November 1945 in the Bavarian city of Nuremberg. Known as the trial of the century, the statements from witnesses sent shockwaves around the world. Hitler and his well, you will, uh, you will... As the true horror of what had occurred at the death camps was described, the defendants were desperate to pass the blame. And Eichmann's name kept coming up. His role was starting to be understood. A colleague of Eichmann's, Dieter Vicheslenny, claimed he had said he would leap into my grave laughing because the feeling that I have five million human beings on my conscience is for me a source of extraordinary satisfaction. Once this statement was made public, Eichmann realized that the hunt for him would never cease. So, on February the 5th, 1946, Eichmann escaped. With the help of the SS officers in the camp, he managed to slip through an unguarded section of the barbed wire fence. He headed south to the small market town of Prien, where he spent the next six weeks being sheltered by an SS sympathizer. From there, Eichmann moved to the small town of Everson in northern Germany. There, the brother of a captured SS officer employed Eichmann as a forester. For a time, he passed unnoticed by the authorities. But Eichmann's luck was not to last when the logging company went bankrupt. Eichmann now feared it wouldn't be long before he was captured. It was time to take responsibility for his freedom into his own hands. So he contacted the only people he knew who could help, Odessa. Odessa was a shadowy organization made up of former SS officers and industrialists sympathetic to the Nazi cause. They were able to organize all the documents and money a wanted war criminal would need to escape justice. With the net appearing to tighten, 
Eichmann contacted Odessa to make good his escape. In the spring of 1950, with Odessa's help, he took a train to Munich and from there passed through the Austrian Alps via the Brenner Pass into northern Italy. After a couple of days, he headed for Genoa on the northwest coast of Italy. The plan was to get a boat to Argentina, but first he needed his travel documents. Odessa put him in contact with another Nazi sympathizer who sent him to the Red Cross office in Genoa. There he was issued with a Red Cross passport. He then took the passport to the Argentine consulate, which issued him with an entry visa and the all-important certificate of identity. On June the 17th, Eichmann, now known as Ricardo Clement, boarded a ship for Buenos Aires. Argentina in the 1950s was a good place to be an ex-Nazi. Juan Perón, the country's president, and his wife Eva were fascist sympathizers. They turned a blind eye to the Nazis who had been arriving since the end of the war. This provided Eichmann with a network of ex-colleagues who found him lodgings and a temporary job in a metal workshop. A short time later, this was followed by a full-time job as an engineer in a construction company, 700 miles northwest of Buenos Aires. The company was funded by the Argentine government and employed more than 300 Germans, among them several high-ranking Nazi party officials. Eichmann took a cottage in a mountain village and quietly settled in. With the trail having gone cold in Europe, he felt safe for the first time in five years in a country that wasn't interested in his past. But there was one man who was still after him, Simon Wiesenthal. Wiesenthal was a Polish Jew and a Holocaust survivor. He had made it out of the Matthausen concentration camp alive. After helping the Americans capture war criminals in Austria, he had set out on his own. He had made it his life's work to track down the criminals who'd escaped the net at the end of the war. By 1950, his file on Eichmann's shocking war record was bulging. Wiesenthal suspected that like so many other ex-Nazis, Eichmann was now probably holed up in South America. The only problem was, he had no idea where. Wiesenthal did have one lead. Eichmann's wife and family lived in this village in Austria's Althusser region. From his offices, he was able to keep tabs on Eichmann's family. He hoped that one day they would lead him to his quarry. But in June 1952, Eichmann's wife took the children and vanished without trace. Wiesenthal was convinced they were on their way to join Eichmann. He was in despair. With this last link to Eichmann now gone, the trail went completely cold. Eichmann's family were indeed in Argentina. They were living in Olivos, a rundown district of Buenos Aires. But the Argentine economy had collapsed, and like so many in the country, the former Nazi found himself on hard times. His lack of imagination 
the quality that had made him such a good Nazi, made him unemployable. He lost his savings in a failed laundrette venture and struggled to find other work. Meanwhile, back in Austria, news that Eichmann was in Buenos Aires had reached Simon Wiesenthal. He received the tip-off from an informant who showed him a letter detailing Eichmann's whereabouts. The hunt was back on. Wiesenthal immediately contacted the Israeli consulate in Vienna and passed on the information. But to his great disappointment, there was no reaction. Then came a second blow. His funds dried up. Even though he had discovered Eichmann's hiding place, Simon Wiesenthal was forced to close his Nazi hunting office and give up the chase. Unable to fund a trip to Buenos Aires, he packed his files and shipped them to the Yad Vashem Foundation in Israel. Its archive held millions of records that catalogued the Nazis' crimes against humanity. It seemed that the file on the hunt for Eichmann would end up in a museum, gathering dust. The Holocaust's backroom man appeared to have got away with his crimes. In 1957, the focus of the search for Eichmann switched to Frankfurt. Fritz Bauer, attorney general for the Hesse region of West Germany, was a Jewish concentration camp survivor. In April, he received a letter from a fellow concentration camp survivor. The letter gave an address for the Eichmann family home in a suburb of Buenos Aires. Unable to turn to Simon Wiesenthal, Fritz Bauer faced a problem. What to do with this precious piece of intelligence? He was social democrat, he was anti-Nazi, and he was Jewish. And he got the information where Eichmann was living, under what name. And instead of giving it to the German police or the German foreign affairs of foreign office, he came to the Israelis and gave them the information. Bauer could have gone to the German government in Bonn, but his motives for going to the Israelis were simple. I asked him why. You were an official of another country. He said at the time, there were quite a few people who were sympathetic to the Nazis in the German government uh, circles. And I was sure that if I gave them the information, that would have been either shelved, either lost, or Eichmann would have changed his name and his address. The file now landed on the desk of one of Israel's most formidable men, Issa Harel, head of Mossad, the most effective secret service agency in the world. Established in 1949, Mossad's operatives were skilled in all forms of espionage covert operations, sabotage, intelligence gathering, and counter-terrorism. Over the years, it had acquired a fearsome reputation, but it lacked one department, a Nazi hunting unit. Mossad had been receiving sightings of Eichmann and other ex-Nazis for years. But without a dedicated department to follow these leads up, 
They preferred to leave private individuals like Simon Wiesenthal to do the detective work. Eventually, on the 6th of November, 1957, Harrell agreed to dispatch one of his agents to Frankfurt to meet Bauer. The agent reported back to Harrell that Bauer's information seemed genuine, but the Mossad chief remained unconvinced. In fact, he did nothing for two years. Eventually, Fritz Bauer lost his patience. He demanded a meeting with his opposite number, Israeli prosecutor Chaim Cohen. Cohen suggested that he, Bauer, and Harrell meet for one last time to review the evidence. Between them, they agreed they would send a team to establish surveillance on the suspected Eichmann. So, Zvi Aharoni, Israel's top investigator, was sent to Buenos Aires. When Aharoni arrived, he went to the Israeli embassy and recruited some local volunteers to help him in his surveillance of Eichmann. On the 3rd of March, 1960, the operation began. Aharoni and his team were able to get close to their target. Using a specially constructed camera in a suitcase, they prepared to photograph him covertly. There was no doubt, it was Eichmann. When Aharoni reported back that the German intelligence had been correct, Harrell wanted to know if he should kill Eichmann. So he went to the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, for advice. He said to him, we have information that Eichmann is alive and in Argentina. What should we do? And Ben-Gurion said to him, bring him dead or alive. Then Ben-Gurion made a decision with massive implications. He waited a moment, then he said, better bring him alive. It will be very important for the young generation. Mossad were told to kidnap Eichmann and bring him back for trial in Israel. Ben-Gurion's reasoning was simple. He felt that the world was forgetting how Jews across Europe had suffered less than two decades before. He believed that seizing Eichmann and putting him on trial for his crimes would remind the world of the horrors of the Holocaust. In April 1960, the main snatch team flew into Argentina disguised as air stewards. The eight-man team was led by Rafi Eitan. Harrell would join them in person a few days later. He wanted to be on hand to make sure everything went according to plan. First, the Mossad team set up an observation post in a van. From there, they watched Eichmann's home for days. They waited, assessing the best moment to strike. Finally, at around eight o'clock in the evening of May the 11th, they went into action. One of those who snatched Eichmann, Moshe Tavor, recounts what happened next. ובא רפי, והכנסנו אותו לתוך המכונית, סתמנו לו את הפה, 
הכנתי משקפיים שלא רואים כלום. He put up a brief struggle, but was quickly overwhelmed, thrown into a car, and driven off at high speed. They brought him to a house. They kept him there prisoner, and uh, uh, at one of the most dramatic moments, he said, uh, Ich bin Adolf Eichmann. They asked him, who are you? He said, Ich bin Adolf, I'm Adolf Eichmann. And he said, I know I am in the hand of the Israelis. He was held in a secret location for several days before the Mossad team could extract him back to Israel. Now they had Eichmann, they had to get him out of Argentina without being caught. So they decided to drug him. They dressed him in a uniform of a, of a member of the, of the El Al uh, steward. A few evenings before the departure of the plane, people uh, of the, uh, the so-called flight attendants were coming every night, like a little bit, you know, drunk after having a good time in, in the clubs of Buenos Aires. And the Argentinian police officers got used to that, that they're coming back to the plane, dragging or bringing or carrying one of their friends who drank a little bit too much. So when one evening they came back with another guy who was a little bit uh, uh, uneasy on his feet, let's put it this way, they let him go through. That was Eichmann. At 7.35 on the morning of May the 22nd, 1960, the plane carrying Eichmann touched down in Tel Aviv. He was at last on Israeli soil. At 4 p.m. on May the 23rd, 1960, David Ben-Gurion strode into the Knesset, the parliament in Jerusalem. There he announced that Adolf Eichmann, one of the world's most wanted war criminals, had been captured. What's more, Eichmann was already in Israel and would face trial. News of Eichmann's capture raced around the world. Jewish communities everywhere rejoiced. But Argentina was less enthusiastic about a kidnapping on its soil and demanded the Nazi be repatriated. Golda Meir, Israel's ambassador at the UN, rejected these accusations, saying that Eichmann's crimes far outweighed those of the Israelis. Is this a threat to peace? Eichmann brought to trial by the very people to whose total physical annihilation he dedicated all his energies, even if the manner of his apprehension violated the laws of the Argentine. As preparations were made for Eichmann's trial, the Israelis set about building the case against him. On the 29th of May, 1960, Eichmann's interrogation began. The prosecutors were determined to get hard facts and form a watertight case around his role in the Third Reich, and in particular, the final solution. Over the following nine months, he underwent 275 hours of interview, which ran to over 3,000 pages of notes. To fulfill David Ben-Gurion's wish that the trial should be a world event, a newly built amphitheater was modified to accommodate the court. The international media could flash the proceedings all over the globe using state-of-the-art equipment. Adolf Eichmann's trial began in Jerusalem 9 a.m. on April the 11th, 1961, before three of the country's most distinguished judges, each of them Jews who had escaped from Germany in 1933, the year Adolf Hitler became Chancellor. Now, after 15 years in hiding, a 
and one year after his sensational abduction from Argentina, Adolf Eichmann is indicted on 15 counts of crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanity. Positioned behind bulletproof glass, Eichmann prepared to defend himself. He was not just being charged with crimes against Jews, but also crimes against non-Jews and membership of hostile organizations, including the SS and Gestapo. He responded to each charge in the same way. When asked how he pleaded, he simply replied, in the sense of the indictment, no. In fact, this was the recurring theme throughout his trial, that he had never killed anyone personally, and that he was merely obeying orders. Against Eichmann was a raft of evidence from the survivors of the camps themselves. Some of the witnesses were overcome with emotion. Gideon Hausner, Israel's Attorney General, meticulously presented the case against Eichmann using documents that had been saved by Nazi hunters like Simon Wiesenthal. The case was damning. Finally, on December the 15th, 1961, Eichmann was found guilty of all counts and sentenced to death. At midnight on June the 1st, 1962, the sentence was carried out. It was the first and last time that the State of Israel would carry out a judicial execution. Eichmann's body was cremated under cover of darkness in a makeshift oven, and the ashes scattered miles out over the Mediterranean Sea. The Israeli authorities wanted no trace left which could be turned into a Nazi shrine. The death of Eichmann was splashed across front pages all over the world. It re-energized the cause of Nazi hunting. One beneficiary was Simon Wiesenthal. Even though he had played only a small part in the capture of Eichmann, it suited Mossad to deflect attention and let him take the credit. Wiesenthal's reputation soared. Funds poured in, enabling him to carry on with his Nazi hunting activities and chase other wanted Nazis. Following the Eichmann affair, Fritz Bauer, whose own involvement remained secret for 20 years, continued to prosecute war criminals until his death in 1968. Issa Harel, the Mossad chief, who was at first so reluctant to follow up Bauer's information on Eichmann, resigned in 1963 to take up a short-lived career in politics. He died, aged 91, in 2003. As for Eichmann, the little functionary who helped kill so many people, he would epitomize the phrase that would describe so many other Nazis, the banality of evil.